it's very common for counselors to find themselves with clients who have uh, come to them for help because they've been um, they're in a very unusual and difficult trial. Perhaps uh, there's been a relationship that has been very disappointing. Maybe they've been hurt, offended, uh, maybe even abused or abandoned or um, betrayed by loved ones, family members, uh, husbands or wives, family, whatever. It's not uncommon to find those sorts of people show up for counseling. And uh, certainly a good biblical counselor will want to be very compassionate, kind, loving, good listener, and someone who can offer um, understanding and sympathy and compassion to someone who has been betrayed and hurt in such a way. But at some point, uh, the counselor wants to work, work, be well, do well in the area of the compassion. But at some point, uh, we, the counselor at the right time in the right way uh, has to turn the, the attention to what would God have this particular person learn uh, through the difficult and hard situation that they're going through in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, would typically at some point come up in the appropriate time as the counselor explains to them what that verse says and what it means. And it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, And we know that in all things God works together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And that um, that's a comforting verse as uh, we go through difficult times to trust that God's in control and he's orchestrating everything together for my good. Well, then how does that apply to my betrayal, my hurt, the harmful things that have happened to me? And that's a good dialogue for a counselor and a client to have at some point when you feel like the client's ready to go there. But in the course of trying to help a client understand that verse and how it applies, oftentimes the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis uh, can be a very, very helpful illustration and story as to how one person went through a very, very difficult time, but came out of it at the end, understanding that God does work all things together for good. And uh, we're going to look at that story in part one today. Uh, I'm going to give you a very brief, very quick summary of the story and speak to you about what Joseph has to say to uh, his family on one occasion. And then there are four or five verse, uh, chapters later. Then he says a second sermon, if I can call it that. He uh, talks to his family a second time about the harmful and difficult things that they, uh, ways that they betrayed him. So let's get started. Uh, the story of Joseph begins in chapter 37 of Genesis. I'm going to tell you this story very quickly. But um, Joseph has, uh, God gives Joseph dreams. He gives Joseph two dreams. And uh, in the course of those two dreams, the, the meaning and the interpretation that Joseph has from God about those two dreams is this. He's the youngest of the uh, siblings, the uh, brothers in the family, but he, the dream has indicated to his family that he is going to rise up above his family and he's going to rule over his family and they are going to bow down to him. <laughs> now, his, his family does not take very kindly to that. And uh, so what his brothers decide to do is, number one, betrayal number one, his brothers decide to uh, throw this uppity little young boy, the father's favorite, throw him into a pit. They sell him into a caravan going to Egypt, and they're done with the boy. They go home and lie to their father about what's happened to the son. The blood on his shirt, jacket, is a lion. He must have been eaten, and the father grieves the loss of Joseph. But actually, Joseph now is on his way as a slave to Egypt. So betrayal number one is Joseph being betrayed in the most severe and awful way on behalf of uh, his brothers. He gets to Egypt. He becomes Potiphar's right-hand man. Uh, he's lord of the whole household. Uh, but Potiphar's wife has eyes for Joseph and tries to seduce him on a couple of different occasions. One time she tries to seduce him and he says, I can't do this. The, my master has put me in charge of his family, his household. How could I ever do such a thing? And he runs away. Potiphar's wife grabs his coat when Potiphar gets home, the wife says, look at this Hebrew 
young man sport you put in charge of our family. He tried to seduce me. He tried to rape me. He tried to take advantage of me. How could you let this person into our house? Potiphar sees red, takes Joseph, and throws him into prison. Betrayal number two. Falsely accused of rape, sexual immorality with Potiphar's wife. Potiphar, without hearing both sides of the story, looking for evidence, witnesses, so forth and so on, takes Joseph, falsely accuses him of being inappropriate, like his wife, throws him into prison, and Joseph is there for a number of years, falsely accused. Betrayal number two by his, fa uh, his, his boss, Potiphar, who had come to trust him implicitly with everything in his household. He's in prison. And uh, now remember, Joseph has the gift of dreams and the gift of interpreting dreams. And in prison with him is Pharaoh's cup bearer, the person responsible for bringing the cup to Pharaoh, a cup of wine perhaps, and his baker. And they've been thrown into prison. Well, they both have dreams and they don't know how to interpret their dreams, but they hear about Joseph and they ask Joseph, how do you interpret our dream? And so Joseph, Joseph interprets the dream, and for the cupbearer, it's a happy ending to the dream. The dream, the interpretation is you're going to be restored to your uh, executive privileges in Pharaoh's court. You're going to become his cupbearer again, so you'll be restored to your position. Cupbearer's happy about that. Well, the baker says, well, what about my dream? He's hoping for a similar interpretation. But Joseph says, well, your interpretation is this. Pharaoh's going to, to murder you and kill you because he's displeased with you, and that's the interpretation of the dream. And as uh, Joseph's interpretations are always correct, because God gives him those interpretations, the cupbearer is reinstated to Pharaoh's service as the cupbearer, and indeed the baker is put to death uh, because of Pharaoh's displeasure with him. But Joseph in prison says to the cupbearer, when you go up there and now you become Pharaoh's cupbearer again, remember me, tell him about me, and, uh, and, and, and tell him that I'm falsely accused and speak on my behalf. I've been good to you. Be good to me. Speak to Pharaoh when you're there and tell him about my plight. Well, the text is very clear, and it says that the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph and went about his service in, to Pharaoh. Well, I think it's about two years later that Pharaoh now has a dream by, from God, and he doesn't know how to interpret that dream. And, but he does hear, the cupbearer suddenly says, oh, I forgot. I forgot about this guy down in prison. I should have been more timely to talk to you about him, but he does. Uh, God does give him interpretation of dreams. Pharaoh, I would suggest that you get Joseph from prison, bring him into your presence, tell him your dream, and let Joseph interpret it for you. Pharaoh does that very same thing, brings Joseph, tells him the dream. Can you interpret the dream for me, Pharaoh says, and Joseph says, only God can interpret the dream. But here's what God has said about the dream that he gave you. Here's the interpretation. You're going to have... Egypt and you as Pharaoh are going to have years of uh, abundant crops. But that's going to be followed by a season of seven years where you're going to have famine, where there can be neither sowing or reaping. And so that is the interpretation of the uh, dream, and that's going to be coming very, very soon. Well, Pharaoh hears it, listens to it, takes it to heart, and says, well, what should I do? And Joseph says, well, you really ought to save up the grain from the five good years or seven good years so that you do have grain for the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh says, well, Joseph, you're my man. Uh, you're now number two in the kingdom. I'm number one. You're two and number two. Do what you thought was best in this matter as well as anything else that you think the ways of the kingdom ought to be reigned. So Joseph becomes number two. But there was betrayal number three. First of all, his brothers. Secondly, there was Potiphar's wife. And then thirdly, the cupbearer forgot about Joseph when he went back into the service with Pharaoh. Violated, betrayed, and forgotten. Three very, very painful situations. And uh, Joseph, I think, was in prison for two more years because the cupbearer fa failed to mention this to uh, Pharaoh. Well, okay, so 
if we're looking at someone in the in the scriptures who um, has had a difficult and a hard life, one who has been abused, one who has been betrayed and hurt and violated very deeply, we would certainly put Joseph into that category. Well, as the story goes on, now is the years of famine. And lo and behold, coming down from Israel into Egypt is Joseph's brothers, whom the father has sent to Egypt to buy grain because the famine is affecting Israel up there. And so they came to Egypt to get grain and, um, and they bump into, guess who? They bump into Joseph, who's selling the grain. They don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them as the brothers who had betrayed them betrayed him, I should say. Well, there's a couple of chapters about some stories which we're not going to go into at this point. Some looks like where Joseph is really angry. He's hurt. He's angry. Looks like he tries to get a little bit of revenge and vengeance there. But eventually, Joseph is in the presence of his brothers. And in chapter 45, this is what Joseph says, and this is what the, Joseph says to his brothers. When Joseph could no longer control himself before all the attendants, he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, now remember betrayal number one, betrayal number two, and betrayal number three. I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified in his presence. You can imagine. You're our brother, the one that we sold into slavery. You're now Pharaoh's right hand man. We, oh no, what's he going to do to us? So obviously, and for good reasons, they're very, very terrified. Joseph goes on to say, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. Now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there'll be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay you shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, because for five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all that you belong to you will be destitute. Okay, so Joseph uh, eventually makes himself known to his brothers. And there's three things that I'd like to point out in terms of this sermon this, this little speech that he gives to his brothers once he begins to realize, uh, or rather uh, uh, um, uh, make himself known to his brothers. Three things. Number one, when he begins to do it, uh, and before he does it, apparently he weeps uncontrollably. And um, that's a very common experience for people who have been hurt, damaged, betrayed, maybe abused, terribly, suffering terribly at the hands of others, it's very hurtful, it's very painful, it's very difficult, it's very, very challenging. And sometimes there are weeks and months and even years of crying and weeping and 
over what's happened and the consequences of what's happened because of that. And so it's not surprising that now that his brothers, Joseph had forgotten about his brothers, the text is very clear that the farther he got away from his family and brothers and what had happened, he more and more forgot about what happened and put the matters behind him. But now his brothers are in front of him and all that betrayal now is coming to the forefront. And so it is appropriate that we would find Joseph weeping and wailing so loud that Pharaoh's household uh, was able to hear about that. The weeping that has to take place in the course of betrayal like that is, like I said, something that takes place very deeply, very frequently, and perhaps for even long periods of time. Secondly, Joseph was proper to say to his brothers, I'm here because you're the one that sent me here. You sold me into slavery. Listen to what he says. Come close to me. I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. Joseph is placing some blame on the part of his brothers who contrived a plan, threw him in a pit, saw the caravan, pulled him out, sold him into slavery, lied to the father. That was all done by Joseph's brothers, and he's rightfully saying to them, you were wrong to do what you did. I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. Uh, he said, so then, it was not you who sent me here, but God, saying, you did send me here. And he mentions it about three times, laying, saying to his brothers, you sold me into slavery. Uh, Joseph is not, is not minimizing that. He's not sweeping it under the carpet. <clears throat> He's telling them that they were culpable and responsible for what they did, that they did something that they really should not have done. And Joseph's proper to point that out to his brothers. Now, undoubtedly, when they heard Joseph say, you're the one who sold me into Egypt, they might think, well, that's it. We're doomed. We're done. We're dead. We're, we're out of here. We're, we're doomed. But Joseph doesn't stop there. He says that. And it's appropriate that he, he addresses abusers and tell them, you're the one who betrayed me and you're the one who sent me here. But that's not the end of the story, nor is it the biggest part of the story or even the most important part of the story. If you're a client today or you're getting counseling or you're one who has been abandoned or betrayed or abused, you have a very similar story as Joseph. And undoubtedly, you have wept uh, many, many times, and perhaps for many, many years, over not only what has happened to you, but the consequences that has played out in your life. And I'm sure weeping has been a part of that process for you. And I'm sure there are many times in your mind, you have pointed out in your own mind who the abuser or the one who has betrayed you really has. And perhaps you've even come to the point of even addressing it with the person that who has abused you or betrayed you. It would not be inappropriate to do that. But Joseph does a third thing, which is very important that we understand. Joseph is saying, you did something, but you know what? You're not the biggest part of the story. The biggest part of the story is what God was doing. And he says this, so do not be angry for selling yourselves here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. And then he says again in verse 7, But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save the lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now Joseph is doing something that's important for us all to know how to do and learn how to do with little trials and medium trials and terribly awful, horrible trials. Such things as abuse and betrayal and and harm and things like that. Joseph is saying, has come to the point of understanding, you know what, in all these matters, from the very beginning, by God giving me this dream, in all this matters of the brothers selling me into slavery so that I would get down to Egypt to be here at this point in time, for me to be picked out of the slave market by Potiphar, 
Why Potiphar? God must have been working in the behind the scenes to line me up with Potiphar. God must have been working to get the Potiphar's wife to falsely accuse me. I was not in prison for by an accident. God put me in prison for a plan. It was for my good. Eventually, I would be delivered there or learn that I was an interpreter of dreams. And why did the baker forget? Why did the, the cupbearer forget about me? That was part of God's plan. But at the right time, when Pharaoh had a dream, now it was brought to Pharaoh's attention by the cupbearer. Hey, I know someone who can interpret your dream. Then he was brought up to Pharaoh, interpreted the dream, and now he's number two. And Joseph came to the point of understanding something that's crucial for us to understand as well. And that is all things work together for our good, even the difficult and the hard things. That, in other words, when we're betrayed, oftentimes God is in the background and an irrelevant person. And the person who betrayed me is in the foreground, in the foreground. And for years and maybe decades, that person did that. They abused me, all the consequences that because of that. But Joseph said, wait a minute. They didn't stop doing what they did, but you know what? God was using everything that they did to accomplish good. And I have to submit to that and understand that they did it to harm me, but God intended it for good. And so Joseph came to understand and submitted to the idea, the biblical truth, that God does work all things together for good, and that he really is the one who is really in control. Really, his brothers were not. He came to understand it. Neither was Potiphar. Neither was Potiphar's wife. Neither was the cupbearer who forgot. All these people were working in God's plan to accomplish what was being done of getting Joseph ultimately to Pharaoh's court and to being number two in the land so that, that he would be in a position to be able to provide when the family came. And so he said, don't be angry with yourselves. I'm not angry at you. Don't be angry at yourselves for selling me here. You intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. So don't be angry with yourselves. And then he says, go down, get my father, get my other siblings and get the whole, get everybody, bring them to Egypt. I'm going to put you up in the best place that you could possibly be. I'll provide for you. Bring my father. Bring Benjamin. Bring your herds. Bring your other families. Bring everybody, and you'll live there, and I'll take care of you, and I'll provide for you. Pharaoh says the same thing. If you're a family of Joseph, then you're a family of mine, so to speak. I'll provide for you. And so Joseph, if he was, if, if, if the brothers were in the foreplay and God was not in the picture, he'd be, he would have strung them up and hung them up and put them to death. But he came to understand that God was really in governing all of these affairs for a good purpose, not for a bad purpose, for a good purpose. And he came to understand that. And in understanding that, he was able to forgive his brothers, obviously. And then on top of that, he was willing to provide for them ever, all the good things that he had in Egypt were now going to become in part theirs as well. What a wonderful story. What an amazing story. And we're told about that in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, when it says, all things work together for good. And we know that all in all things, God works together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. How about you today? I know you've been hurt. I know you've been betrayed. I know that you've been damaged, and I know that you've gone through terrible and difficult trials. Have you come to the point, are you wrestling through with a counselor, trying to get to the place of putting the abuser and the ones who have damaged you, putting them in the background, not out of the picture, but in the background, and learning how to think of God as really being in the foreground, and God being behind the scenes, working all those things together, and working all those things together for your good. Sometimes it takes a long time to get to that place, but I pray that you have found a counselor who is working hard and diligently in helping you to get to that happy place, that peaceful place, to where you can, you're done crying, and where you can say to, uh, at least mentally, uh, and perhaps even at some point in the future, personally, you hurt me when you did this. But you know what? God was really in control working all these things together 
greater good and being able to be benevolent toward the person who has betrayed you so uh, deeply and so um, hurtfully. Thanks for being with me today. We're going to look at, now Joseph's story is not over. Now, what's going to happen is Joseph's father is going to come down to Israel and he's going to die. And now the brothers huddle together and they say to themselves, you know what? Now that the old man is dead, Joseph's been waiting for the father to die. And now that the old man's dead, now he's going to come after us. Now he's going to get vengeance. Now he's going to take care of business. And we're doomed. And uh, Joseph has a different story than that. And in our second uh, um, video, relative to Joseph. We're going to look at what he tells his brothers after the father dies that I think will be of interest to look at as well. Thanks for being with me today.